Well, this week we're starting chapter 12, which is a new direction for Paul to go in. Uh, as we've already discussed, the first eight chapters were doctrine of the Christian faith. And uh, 9, 10, and 11, chapter 9, 10, and 11, were about uh, talking to the Jews. But uh, from 12 until 16 is going to be how to put what you've learned into practice. And Paul is going to tell us what a Christian should look like. And of course, it's, it's not much different from what Jews were expected to look like, but except he was talking about spiritual things rather than the written law on tablets. Chapter 12 begins a new direction of Paul's teaching towards application of what he's been saying versus theory. So far, he has been making the theory of the new teaching to the Jewish mindset so that they may understand the reasons for the Gentile adoption into the church and to show the Gentile believers their new role into the church Jesus was starting with the advent of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit was a, a mystery and a, a, a promise. All the way through the Bible, people didn't really understand what the promise was and what the mystery was. Well, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, then the, the Holy Spirit revealed what the mystery and the promise was. So the beginning of the church was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now the Jews knew about the Holy Spirit, but they, didn't, they knew that it didn't stay with you. That it would come and give revelation to you and comfort you and then it would leave. But now Christians are being taught that the Holy Spirit would stay with us forever. Um, he was showing through the Old Testament how this was prophesied from long ago to come about and how the Jews missed this teaching for thousands of years. In other words, the Jews studied and studied and, and examined every word in the Bible, but somehow or, they, or another they missed the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. There was one sect of the Jews that didn't miss this teaching, however. The Essenes existed at least 200 years before Christ and were considered another sect besides the Pharisees and Sadducees. All we ever hear about is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But there was another sect, and they were considered extremists, and they were called the Essenes. This is uh, the, the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the, in the caves of Qumran. First of all, it verified that the scriptures hadn't changed in many thousands of years. <clears throat> but what the Essenes pointed out in their own writings and their own teachings was that they separated themselves from the Jude uh, Jewish uh, sects of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they felt like that they were be becoming too worldly so they left Jerusalem and the temple life and started in the in the synagogue life and they lived out in the wilderness they lived in some very dry and dusty places that no one else would want to live they lived uh, more like monks and and uh, uh, had a very strict code and they believed that uh, that the earth was going to come into a final conflict of the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And so they read the scriptures quite differently than what the Jews and the Sadducees did. But it sounds more like a Christian than any other thing. In fact, some of the people felt like that John the Baptist and Jesus might have been taught by the Essenes. So the Essenes were all over uh, uh, Israel in groups, but they just weren't ever as big as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were convinced that the Pharisees and Sadducees were corrupt and twisting Scripture for their advantage and power. Of course, we know Jesus agreed with that way of thinking. He never talked very kindly to the Pharisees. He, he pretty much called them uh, snakes and, and uh, white sepulchers, uh, tombs and you know, walking dead type of people. So he was never very nice to what they were saying because he knew that they were wrong. And they completely missed the teaching of the Old Testament even though they were experts on it. They were best known for the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1949 buried in caves. Some of the writings sounded a lot like what Jesus taught and what Paul was teaching now. So they took it spiritually. They understood that it wasn't just written down in carnal language, that it meant spiritual things. But people couldn't understand that unless they thought deeper thoughts. Uh, scholars today describe them as extreme fanatics. I always thought that was funny that someone that believed the Bible and believed spiritual things would be described as fanatics. 
And if, you, if you'll stop and think about it, when somebody says an evangelical, that puts a picture in your mind of something different. It, if somebody says a Catholic, you know what that means. If they said a, a Lutheran, they know what that means. But when somebody says an evangelical, what are exactly are they saying? They're saying somebody that's pushy and thinks weird things and wants to convert you over and all that. Well, doesn't a Lutheran want to convert to Christianity? That's our job. That's our only job was to take the gospel to the whole world. But uh, I think people think that they're just born into Christianity and that's what the church is. But they really just looked at the scriptures in a spiritual sense and went deeper into their thinking than anyone else at the time. When reading their teachings, you can see they believe more like a Christian than a Jew at the time. The Essenes are a group that literally abandoned Jerusalem, it seems, in, pro in protest against the way the temple was being run. In other words, they got the heck out of Jerusalem because they figured it was going to be destroyed, which it was, and they lived in caves and stuff and tents out in the desert. So here's a group that went out in the desert to prepare the way of the Lord following the commands as they saw it of the prophet Isaiah. They paid a lot of attention to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and they saw that uh, Jeremiah and, and Isaiah were, were apocalyptic. And they were saying that bad times were going to come because of the way the world was going. So they got, they got out of Dodge and started living out on their own. Uh, which is a lot of uh, Messianic uh, evangelical Christians think that the end of the world is coming and the tribulation is coming. And it's going to be because of the way the world lives. So they're not very far from what we think today. And they were 200 years at least before Christ. And they lived another 100 years after Christ. And they go into the desert and get away from what they see as the worldliness of Jerusalem and the worldliness of the temple. They didn't even agree with what was going on in the temple. And of course Jesus came in and overturned the tables and started talking about a den of thieves. And the temple life had, had completely changed. It wasn't a house of prayer like God wanted. It became a den of thieves. The basis for that understanding is their reading of Scripture. They interpret Scripture, especially the prophets Isaiah, the Torah itself, to suggest that the course of Judaism is going through a profound change. They knew that Judaism was about to go through a profound change. And see, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and the Jews were killed and Israel was just about uh, destroyed. I mean, it was completely wiped off the map. Far too many people are becoming worldly they would have said. The end, as they understood it, of the present evil age is moving upon them quickly and they want to be on the right side when it comes. In their understanding, there will, be, there will come a day when the Lord revisits the earth with power and in the process establishes a new kingdom for Judaism. It will be like the kingdom of David and Solomon or a return to the golden age mentality. In other words, they saw a golden age coming back when Jesus came back as the Messiah. And this is part of that apocalyptic mindset. They were looking for the appearance of Messiah and believed it in more spiritual interpretation of the scriptures. Remember, this was about 200 years before Christ and lasted about 100 years after Christ rose from the grave. Some historians have even suggested that John the Baptist or even Jesus himself were members of the Essene sect. I wasn't able to find out if they accepted Jesus as their Messiah, but we have new writings found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that showed that they believed the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness and separating themselves out from the world as they knew it. I wasn't able to find out if they knew about Jesus, if they accepted Him as Messiah, or what. But a lot of their teachings was exactly the same as John the Baptist, and repent now or die and go to hell, you know. And Jesus came and, and tried to get everybody to repent and start living for the kingdom. So they, they were almost duplicate of what Jesus and John the Baptist were teaching. Many of the teachings of the Essenes are very similar to Christian teachings. They spoke of a day when the Messiah would eat unleavened bread and wins with his people and the last battle coming that would change the world. So they already had the apocalyptic prophecies and all that down. They knew a, a last battle was coming. 
They even almost quote Luke 1, 31 through 35 in a scroll written before Christ was even born. Luke 1, 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. <clears throat> and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will have no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now this is what the Essenes have in one of their writings. He will be called Great, and He will be called the Son of God. And they will call Him Son of the Most High. He will judge the earth in righteousness, and every nation will bow down to him. And that's in the fourth cave, page 246. See, the, the Essenes had their own scrolls of the Bible, but they also wrote their own things. So they have a lot of information on what the Essenes believed, as well as the exact uh, uh, scriptures <clears throat> that they studied. Now see, one of the problems that the Pharisees had with Jesus was he was the Son of God. And they wanted to kill him. That was blasphemy. But here, 200 years before Christ, they're saying that he will be called the Son of God, the Son of the Most High. So they already knew that whoever this Messiah was going to come, he was not going to be just a great king or a great uh, general that would free them from slavery, from whoever was conquering Israel, that he would be actual Son of God. That's quite out there as far as the Jewish teachings goes. There are several other references that seem to clo too close to dismiss. For example, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. That's John 8, 12. And in the scrolls, we read, All the children of righteousness are ruled by the prince of light and walk in the ways of light, but all the children of falsehood are ruled by the angel of darkness and walk in the ways of darkness. That's the rule of the community number three. Even the famous Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 3 through 12, and in the Sermon on the Plain, Luke 6, 20 through 23, have a striking parallels in the scrolls and apocryphal literature. We do know that Paul was taught for three years by Christ himself and was given insights into the new kingdom that the Jews had missed. But some believe that the Essenes may have had revelation given to them that others didn't receive. They somehow had great insight into what was coming. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now this is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. And it talks about being a living sacrifice. And they keep repeating it over and over again, but I still don't think that a lot of Christians understand what a living sacrifice sacrifice is. Now sacrifice is killed. It's given up. It's given its life for a belief. We are to turn over our lives to God and become a living sacrifice so that we no longer look to our carnal needs and depend solely upon Jesus Christ and His love. What I like to get across and what I teach is that we need to start understanding that being a Christian is an agreement that we've made that is more than just saying, well, I believe Jesus Christ was the Lord and Savior. This is falling in love and having a relationship with someone in the kingdom, a spirit, that is not of this world. And so our carnal lives have to be given up. And that means it has to come secondary to Jesus Christ. He is first and all things else will be added to you. So we always have to go to Jesus first and become a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to give up your life and die. But He is asking you to give up your life and live. Because He is not here to do the work. You're the, arm, the hands and feet that He wants to build a church and to spread the gospel and bring people to the kingdom. So that's what our agreement is. And He's fixing to call it our reasonable service. Which is our reasonable service. Now if someone dies for you, don't you think you owe him something? This is, in other words, he purchased you 
And we say, well, I wasn't really for sale. So we have to understand that He purchased us. And our reasonable service is to do what He wants. Okay? Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed is the same word in Matthew 17, 2, as transfigured. So by transforming our minds, we are transfiguring ourselves. Uh, it, when you read about the transfiguration uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus turned from a man into a, a man of light. He became light. That is quite the transformation. That is, so our mind is going to go through such changes. It's not going to be a subtle change. It's going to be darkness and light. We're, our mind is supposed to be filled with light. And we're not supposed to be in the dark anymore. So this transformation is a transfiguration of our mind. And it must be brand new. We, in other words, we are a new creature. Now, we are not like everyone else. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. What happened when, uh, when Adam ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, is he lost relationship with the Father. We have relationship with the Father. He lives in us. So we have been transformed or transfigured into a new creature. And this marks us as children of the kingdom. So we have a down payment to get into the kingdom. We are the kingdom people. Here Paul is asking the listener to bring your body to God as a sacrifice. Separated to God only. Now what does it mean to be separated to God? That means be holy. Holiness doesn't mean necessarily so good. It just means set apart, completely useful for God. Whatever God wants, He gets with you. If you are a holy person, you are set apart for God only. Not for the world, not for anything else, but for God. Which is our reasonable and logical answer for someone that has given their life to purchase you for himself. Exodus 29, 37. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. How are we going to get to the altar if we're not holy? We must become holy or we can't come within any distance of the Holy of Holies. The altar is at the Holy of Holies. So we can't come to that mercy seat with any sacrifice at all unless we are holy. So if we're not set apart completely for God as a living sacrifice, how are you ever going to get into the Holy of Holies? All Jews knew about the temple sacrificial system and where an animal was chosen or elected to lay down their life for God for a holy sacrifice. If we accept the sacrifice of Jesus for our salvation, do we not at least owe Him our reasonable service? In other words, He laid down His life as a sacrifice. If we're going to accept that sacrifice, do we not owe something to the sacrifice? We are now to reject the ways of the world and prepare for the kingdom. The only way to do that is to renew your mind from what the world thinks to what you now believe. A poll is taken today for almost every situation to show you what the majority thinks. If you look at the TV, they poll for everything. They're going to poll you on what you think about a presidential candidate. They're going to poll you on what you think about the price of food, the price of gas, uh, what you think about the Russians and the Japanese. And Everyone wants to know what you think. Well, almost everything that we think is from the world. And God doesn't want us to think the way the world thinks. So this is why he says love your enemies. No one loves their enemies. So almost everything that God teaches is opposite of what the world thinks. So when somebody is telling you poll numbers and saying, well, 58% believe opposite the way you do, that's supposed to intimidate you and bring you into the, to the herd mentality. We, we are separate. We're not in the herd. We're in a totally different bunch of people. God almost always prefers you not to follow what the world thinks. The world is ruled by the enemy and requires you to ignore God. The world is going to require you to believe the way the world wants you to believe. That is why we're going to keep losing and losing and losing as the world becomes one world government. Because they're going to say you must accept things that aren't biblical. 
you have you must accept things that aren't uh, godly. You must accept things that are filthy. That's the way they're going to treat you. Okay. Romans seven fifteen through twenty five. What well, that that passage is about uh, the things that I want to do I don't do and the things that I do I don't want to do. And he is going through this battle with the world because his carnal mind is telling him to go along with the world, but he knows the scriptures tell him something different. What Paul is saying in chapter 12 is to put what you've learned into practice. Knowing things is not the same as doing things. Political correctness is straight from the pit of hell. Everyone wants to feel as though they belong. If the Word of God conflicts with what the world thinks, we must choose whom we will follow. Don't be double-minded. So we do have freedom of choice. But know this, when you go politically correct and you want to not be thought of ill by the rest of the world and you don't want your friends and neighbors to think ill of you and you go along with this, you have enmity with the Lord. Because most likely, if you follow the crowd, you're going to be wrong. Because the Bible is going to teach different. Verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So he is saying, look, I've been given grace and I've been given uh, knowledge, special knowledge, so I can be your apostle teacher. And he's telling them that everyone likes to think of themselves smarter than they are. He says, be humble and don't think highly of yourself. And everyone has been given a measure of faith. So if you... Uh, doubt yourself then you must rely on your faith and start and pray for more faith for as we have many members in one body but all the members do not have the same function now here he's trying to, to tell you that you may be an experienced Christian with lots of years under your belt and somebody else may have just been saved a week ago but we all have a use in the body and he is saying everyone is valuable because even if you're a toe or a finger you may not have the same strength as an arm, but you're needed. In some capacity, the church as a body needs you, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We are connected to one another. Just like if I cut your finger off, you can say, well, it's just a finger. It's not my whole hand. It's not my arm. Well, your finger is going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, your arm is going to say, ow, that hurts, because we are all tied together. So when we lose a member of our body, then it should hurt everyone. And we must know that we have lost a member. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching... He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So he is saying we're all given gifts. Even when you come out of the baptistry, you have been given gifts. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you've been given gifts. So you must discover what your gifts are and use them in the body. And whatever it is, you're supposed to use it uh, to your best ability. Because everyone will be equipped to do a function in the church. Here Paul is stating that we should be careful thinking of ourselves higher than we ought to think. Each of us has been given gifts of varying depth according to the grace God has bestowed on each of us. Each of us is necessary for a body to function at top efficiency. We tend to put these gifts in a pecking order. And see, here's another thing. A lot of people say, well, I'm a prophet or I'm a preacher. Well, that's not any better than somebody that gives liberally because somebody is going to need some money and they're going to say, well, I have the money, so I'll give it liberally. Another person may have the money, but he hasn't got the gift of giving, so he's a skinflint and holds on to his money and doesn't want to participate. Another one might be a pro prophet. Now, a prophet has a different meaning in the Old Testament as it does in the New Testament. A prophet was generally having revelation from God but a prophet today has revelation from the Holy Spirit to tell what a passage thinks. Now, we can have new revelation uh, while we sleep or while we think or while we pray, 
But most of the time, we're going to be understanding what the Scripture has already told us. After Revelation, you know, the book was closed and there was no more, uh, supposedly no more Revelation. Or there's no more written Revelation. So a prophet will have Revelation from the Holy Spirit. A teacher will learn the Scriptures and teach what he knows from the Scriptures. But it might not necessarily come uh, from Revelation. And a lot of people think that the, that the gifts come in a pecking order. Some are valuable and others aren't. That's not true. Uh, <clears throat> the order he lists the gifts has no status over another. In the New Testament, prophecy just means discerning and explaining the Scriptures through revelation. In the Old Testament, prophecy had more prominent station than it does today. Prophecy and teaching are very similar, but prophecy comes with revelation from the Spirit while teaching is more like learning the scriptures and expounding on what you've learned. These gifts spoken of in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12 were remarkably similar to what is found written by the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls written 200 years before Christ, and not something new to the Jews. Most Christians think these gifts were part of a new religion taught by Paul, but they were actually known in the Second Temple era in Jerusalem. So the Jews knew about these gifts. They knew about teaching and prophecy and giving and all of those gifts. Okay? Now we're going to learn what a Christian should look like to the outside world. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. So he is saying, I want you to love people without hypocrisy. Don't make things up. If you don't love them, then at least act like that you love them but you're loving them in hypocrisy. Okay? But you must train your heart to love. It doesn't come easy, and it's not natural. Abhor what is evil. That ought to be easy. If you see something that is evil, stay away from it. A lot of people are drawn to evil, like an alcoholic or a pornographer or whatever. They're drawn to it. We have to abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. That's just the opposite. If you see something good, then that's something for you. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Don't try to suck up all the air in the room, but be kind to everyone in the room. Let them speak and let them have an opinion and let them show their gifts and don't think so highly of yourself. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The lagging in diligence would mean that, well, I'm the greeter at the front door and I don't think it's a very important job, so I'm just going to have a glum face and say, here, how you doing, or whatever, and just, they, they see hypocrisy on my face. Why am I the greeter at the door if I'm not glad you're here? You, you must be glad that they're here to be a greeter. Fervent in spirit. In other words, we're supposed to be in, in the spirit all the time. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. So we're supposed to be a rejoicing people with hope in our hearts. We are going to be re resurrected and go and live in the kingdom of God with God and Him be in our presence. Patient in tribulation. Whatever we have to put up with. No, there's not going to be an easy day in our life in the world. But we have to be patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. A lot of people put prayer as the last thing that they do. They will try everything else and then try prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. There are people that are have the gift of hospitality and they are to give to, uh, to the needs of the saints. Now notice it says saints. That doesn't mean everybody. We should be looking after one another. Just like if, if I considered myself the body of Christ... Why would I wash everything but my feet? Why would I get a back rub and not a neck rub? You see, the, the body needs different things and we need to tend to the body. So the saints are very important that we uh, distribute to their needs. Bless those who persecute you. In other words, we think that we need to be mad at people and get back at them and that's the carnal way of doing things. Bless and do not curse. Who wants to see someone that's always cursing and getting mad at people and, and saying, I'm going to get back at them and everything? That's not a Christian attitude. 
And most people can see it, but except when we have it. No, they'll point at someone else, but then they'll say, well, this guy treated me bad, and I can't wait for him to lose his money or lose his wife or lose his job or something like that. Well, we can't think about our body that way. It would be like, I can't wait for that hammer to hit the thumb on our hand, you know. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, how many people see someone that, that has gotten a uh, large uh, gift or maybe a new car or something and, and they're jealous of them? How many of us can say that we actually rejoice that they finally got something they needed? And you know when, when somebody loses something and they weep, maybe they lost a family member or something, it doesn't help sometimes if you say, well, they're in a better place. Just weep with them and hold them and, and try to empathize with them instead of trying to cover it up because they feel like that these are empty words and you can't possibly know how I feel about it. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So there he is saying, uh, treat each other exactly alike, but don't set your mind on high things. Don't look to be the leader. If you're the leader, you'll rise to the top because you'll have the natural ability to lead. Uh, don't be wise in your own opinion. Everybody thinks they're smarter than everybody else. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Now, I, I, I bolded this out so that you would pay attention to it. If it is possible, we're going to have to teach this over and over again. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, we're supposed to live peaceably with all men, even people that aren't our brothers and sisters. But sometimes you just don't have a choice. And this is why people will take a beating or uh, lay down and just quit and all kinds of things. Well, if it depends on you, that's fine. But sometimes they want to kill you. And we have the right of self-defense. And, and he says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. We're going to talk about this some more. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So when something comes upon you, it's not that important that you get back at the person that did something to you because God is going to say, This is my child, and you treated him poorly, so I'm going to repay him. So that's, uh, vengeance belongs to God. You know, we can defend ourselves, but vengeance is different than self-defense. I hope we can understand that. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in, doing, in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not become over, overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, a lot of people have had trouble with uh, heap coals of fire on their head. What he is looking for is if a person expects to be treated badly because he's treating you badly, and you treat him good, he is going to say, why did I treat him badly? And he's going to be self-examining. And he'll be putting coals of fire on his own head. Now, of course, God is watching and he's looking. But there's all kinds of definitions to been, uh, what heaps coals of fire on his head will be. But really what he's going to do is self-examine that you're a better man than he is. Because he will see it. Do not uh, overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. So that, that's basically trying to just live and let live and forget what has been done to you, you know, unless it's hurtful physically. Like I said, I don't want somebody to stab you and say, well, I couldn't defend myself. That's just not what he's talking about. What he is talking about is somebody shortchanging you. Uh, let's say your boss fired you. Well, then go on to another job and pray for that person. And when you see him in Walmart, say hi to him. And uh, buy him a cup of coffee to show yourself a better person than he is. Okay. Verse 9 through 21 is a description of what fruits a true Christian will display if they have committed to Jesus. Saying you believe in Christ is much different than following his teaching. 
following the teaching is the result of what we're supposed to be doing, not just knowing things. And a lot of people, will they can quote you verses and they can teach you things, and then you look at their life and it doesn't appear anything like what they just told you. This is the part of the living sacrifice we discussed in verses 1 and 2. Bearing the marks of a true Christian is much more difficult than following our instinct. Our instinct is always going to be wrong because it's going to be our soulish, carnal feelings. We must commit to pleasing Christ on purpose because it won't come naturally. In other words, you always have to be thinking, what would Christ do? What would Jesus do? First of all, love and hate in the Bible involves actions, not emotions. When you see the words love and hate, uh, when somebody loves somebody, they're treating them good. When somebody hates someone, they're treating them badly. It doesn't necessarily mean they have an emotional connection. They're, it's the way they treat them. It is impossible to force yourself to love someone emotionally, so we must, must make an effort to love people and not rely on emotions. If you start relying on emotions to interpret the Bible, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because you're going to take some things and reject other things. Hate operates the same way. If we are an alcoholic, hating drinking must become a conscious effort to abhor what we used to love, to cling to what is good. The love and hate mentioned here involves outward actions, not emotions. We can never rely on emotions alone to please God. The way an American Gentile looks at love and hate comes from the heart with our emotions. So we are emotional people. And when you say love, they're going to say, well, I can't love that person. Because they would have to make an effort to love that person. And it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is a deceitful above all things and desperate, desperately wicked who can know it? A lot of people say, well, I just uh, live my life through my heart. Whatever my heart tells me to do. Well, then you're desperately wicked and evil. Who can know it? Because your heart is always wrong. You have to train your heart. You have to change your heart. And the way you do that is go through the Scriptures and do what it says. Now, this may sound contradictory, but I want your emotions to be trained by the Scriptures. If we emotionally love someone or hate someone, it comes as an extreme level and is not what the Bible is talking about here. If you say you love someone, then usually you love one person. Or very few people can you love. If you hate someone, that's a visceral hatred that can't come anywhere but from your heart. God wants us to show actions that obey His will rather than rely on hypocrisy from our heart. Our outward behavior should reflect our true inward mind, and that takes transforming by the renewing of your mind. In other words, when you start forcing yourself and thinking about loving someone, you're going to find that it's going to come more naturally. You can train your heart to love someone that you wouldn't have loved before if you start looking for the good things and start rejecting the bad that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus wants our heart to be transformed so that our outward actions reflect our true thoughts without hypocrisy. So in other words, He wants our, our hearts to reflect His will without hypocrisy. In other words, you can't say, well, I hate that person, but I've got to love them because the Bible says so. That's hypocrisy. He wants you to love that person because it comes from your heart. He wants you to retrain your heart to where you love them in a natural fashion. Jesus is looking for a true change in our hearts, not just a mechanical following of religious instructions as a phony. Verse 10 is just a repetition of Leviticus 19, verse 18, that says we should love our neighbor as ourselves. This is not a New Testament idea, but has been the law since the beginning. A whole lot of Christians think that loving your neighbor as yourself is a new teaching. But it's been that way since the beginning, all the way back in the Old Testament. He has told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We need to be diligent in the work of the Lord with good spirit. We should always rejoice in the hope that we have, but show patience in tribulation and always in prayer. The hope that Paul is speaking here is the hope of resurrection. Whenever we see the word hope in the Bible, it's about hoping for our resurrection. It's something that hasn't happened yet, but we have to have faith that it's coming. 
knowing that no matter what happens to us, we will have eternal life with Christ, should show in our lives every day. We should act like resurrected people. We should act like we've been redeemed by the Lord. How does it look to others when we shun working for the Lord and walk around with long faces and gripe about how bad we have it? A lot of Christians will walk around and act like that they aren't redeemed. How, what is attractive about that to some other person that sees it? And then we're always griping about how bad we have it. We should be blessed people and highly favored. They won't ever want what we have if we're always negative and running from working for the Lord. If you're supposed to be the greeter and, you, and you're in the bathroom all the time instead of greeting people, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Prayer is our link to God. So how will we ever become a friend of God without talking to Him? Everybody, and I can just automatically say this without even thinking, everybody needs a better prayer life. Even the prayer warriors will tell you that there are times when they're not praying. Well, then you have more time to pray. <laughs> and we always save prayer for the last thing. Verse 13 speaks of meeting the needs of the saints. We should be kind to everyone, but we must remember that the saints are our brothers and sisters. If we can see a way to help our brothers, they should get preference above a stranger. So if you have a brother that's in trouble, maybe they need their lawn mowed, maybe they need someone to do the dishes, maybe they have a sickness in their family, you should volunteer to help them if you are able. I don't think that you should put your own family in a situation if you're not able. But if you are able, then do it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it for people that aren't brothers and sisters either. But we should prefer the family. We should help strangers, but helping the saints should come first if we can. We should bless those who persecute us and to show them that we live a different way than the rest of the world. We need to be happy for people when they are happy and cry with those that are suffering. Don't be jealous of someone with good news and don't browbeat someone that is hurting. Don't show favoritism to certain people and don't strive to get recognition. There's always somebody that's going to be favorite and everybody's going to be sucking up to them. We're supposed to treat each one equally. And don't try to get recognition. Everyone is always saying, well, if a preacher ever needs a stand-in, I can preach and I'll do this. If they need a preacher, they'll ask you. You don't have to volunteer. But associate with the humble people. Most of all, don't think higher of yourself that is in your own opinion. We need, if we listen more, we might see that others know things we might not know, and we can learn something from them. There are a lot of quiet people out there that know a lot of stuff. But we're always talking. And they don't get a chance to ever say anything. Verse 17 says that we should try not to get even with anyone just for making you mad. If we should always seek out the good things in front of others to be in the will of God. If God repaid evil for evil, the world would have been destroyed eons ago. Imagine what was going through God's heart watching Jesus suffer on the cross. If you look at it from God's point of view, He should have destroyed us long ago. He will repay evil for evil in the last day. But He is saving it up when He will have His vengeance on the world. Verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I'm repeating this because I want everyone to understand that it may not always be possible. I wanted to repeat this verse because so many Christians misunderstand what Paul is saying. It starts with, if it is possible. If we have to realize that sometimes it won't be possible to live peaceably with some men. Christians have been browbeaten with peace and love at all costs. So much that we won't protect ourselves and our families, thinking God will be angry with us. Jesus didn't defend himself because he came to earth to die. When somebody says, what would Jesus do? Jesus didn't defend himself. He didn't even say a kind word about himself. But that's what he was predicted to do. That's what he was supposed to do. He was the perfect sacrifice. That was his job and why he came. He was called the Lamb of God to invoke a picture of sacrifice to the Jews. When Peter drew his sword to protect Jesus, Jesus rebuked him because it was his time to die. It wasn't his time to die before, so he got away from him. If you'll read a lot of the passages, he'll say that he just disappeared because it wasn't his time. When it was his time to die, he rebuked Peter for trying to protect him. 
When Jesus was teaching his apostles, however, he told them to sell their cloak and get a sword. And so many people misuse that verse. But he is saying, look, if they hate you, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. You need to protect yourself. He's telling them to sell their cloak and get a sword so they can protect themselves. We're going to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus because they per persecuted him. But we are supposed to do kingdom work while we are here. There is a purpose for us living down here. And it's not just to become sacrificial lambs to be thrown in a, in a mass grave. If we allow ourselves to be slaughtered, the work will not get done. We are not to be bullies, but self-defense is not sin. David, a man after God's own heart, killed Goliath at around 14 and fought wars until his dying day. Elijah killed 850 priests at Carmel. And there were many more examples of God's men taking him alive. So we have to look at it. You can't just take one verse and say, well, this is the way I'm going to live. You have to look at the Bible as a whole. And he wants us to defend ourselves. Jesus came for the reason of dying for our sins. There was no saving Jesus. He came to die. In fact, we didn't lay a hand on him. God allowed his death. Okay? So he could have called 10,000 angels down and just destroyed the earth and got off the cross. The point Paul was making was that we are to live in peace as much as possible. But you may be required to save yours or someone else's life in your walk with Christ. There is absolutely nothing wrong with defending another person, even a total stranger. If you see that person's in trouble, there's nothing wrong with going through their defense. You don't sit there and say, well, I'm, not, I'm supposed to live peaceably, so I'm going to let this guy get beat, beat up and maybe even killed. If you believe that your wife and children came as a gift from God, it is your responsibility to protect them from harm. Sometimes it is not up to you to live peaceable. A more realistic translation of the sixth commandment is thou shalt not shed innocent blood. To interpret it as shall not kill keeps many Christians from going to war or voting for the death penalty, even for crimes that God requires the death penalty. The reason for the Old Testament is we're shown what God's law is supposed to be. But people say, well, that's not true today. The Old Testament is just as valuable today as it was then. And there are people that deserve death. <clears throat> Remember Jesus said the law will never pass away in Matthew 5 for those that say that the Old Testament, that was the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments came much earlier than David killing Goliath. It also came earlier than Joshua conquering Canaan where he was told by God to kill every man, woman, and child in certain cities. The same people that want to confiscate guns from homeowners wanting to protect themselves murders babies in the womb every day. God expects people to form governments and pass laws that reflect the morals of God. Ergo, the nation's laws will take care of most bullies. Having said all that, a Christian shouldn't be a bully and, in, and instigate violence on his own. We should live peaceably. We should not be instigating violence. But when we see wrong and can right it, we are to defend the right. The last few verses talk about after harm has been done to you, don't seek to avenge yourself. God assures you that He has made note of it who has harmed you and will repay. And that's Deuteronomy 32-35. If harm is done to you by an enemy, you will overcome him with good. This will reflect on Christ and show evil for what it is. If you give food and drink to your enemies, you will be heaping coals of fire on their heads. God has noted the evil and you are expected to represent Christ in your actions as we discussed earlier. If your house is broken into or you are assaulted, you are to turn it into the police and they should uh, go after the perpetrator. That doesn't mean that you go after them yourself, but in the old days they had the uh, avenger of blood from a family member. But we have elected governments now to take care of this for us. The principle involved here is that if you treat a known enemy well, you may be able to draw them towards Christ. Every carnal person will follow their emotions and look just like the enemy looks. Jesus came to show the world another way to live. The only way to do that is to change hearts and minds. Chapter 1 through 8 in Romans was about doctrine and theory. 9 through 11 was about Israel in particular. And chapters 12 through 16 are about practical application of what we've learned. Chapter 12 shows us what a true Christian should look like. 
Next week we'll go on to chapter 13. And there will be more uh, indications of what a Christian should look like in detail all the way to chapter 16.